The session bring you brings us directly into the most interesting new themes of uh, bioenergy. Thank you. So we do have five speakers for this session. Uh, we are asking our speakers to keep hopefully to, in progress oh, uh, to around maybe 12 minutes uh, and we'll give you a warning uh, when you're hitting 14 so we don't run over time. Uh, you've got 15 max per the guidance that Luke sent. <laughs> um, and then we'll take questions uh, after each of our speakers. Uh, so first I will introduce uh, Marcus Millinger, who uh, is from Chalmers University. Over to you, Marcus. Yeah, thanks, Zoe. Um, so I'll best sit down, I feel, um, because of the technical uh, difficulties. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, I will present some work on uh, well, how to prioritize uh, biomass usage in the energy system. Uh, and this is work together with uh, colleagues at, um, at Chalmers and also at TU Berlin. Um, and yeah, if you want to read more about it, there is also a preprint that you will see uh, later. But uh, let's see if it works. Yeah. Yeah, so as you all know, um, biomass is a limited resource and there are a lot of trade-offs involved, um, but it's also a versatile resource that can be used all over the place in the energy system. Um, yeah, and the question, um, one big question is then how should we prioritize this limited resource? Um, and uh, another question is, um, because of these trade-offs, there are also forces to limit um, resources. For instance, for the new uh, Renewable Energy Directive, um, it was proposed to exclude forest residues in the energy system. Um, and the question is, what are the trade-offs involved in the energy system um, if we decide on to do this? Um, and I think this is not enough understood and and i'm hoping to give at least some answer with this presentation um and the other thing is what is a cost effective usage of biomass considering all of the um, variability in the system with solar and wind um for producing aviation fuels so that's obviously one um Others um, talk a lot about firm generation, the need for firm generation in variable uh, renewable energy systems. Um, obviously, industry, they demand hydrocarbons. Um, and if, I mean, for instance, the EU and the UK have a net zero target for the whole economy, uh, which means that the energy system probably has to go negative. Um, so how can we supply that in the energy system and how does it fit with prioritizing uh, the different usages of biomass? Um, because obviously all of these options that we see here can to some extent uh, or in di to different extents be combined with uh, carbon capture, but there are also competing options. So, and uh, because it's a mixed audience, I'll start with takeaways. Um, so we come to the result that removing biomass residues actually results in a 20% higher uh, energy system cost. Um, and I will fill in the details. Um, and the main value of biomass in the energy system is actually rather carbon provision than the actual energy that it provides. It's also important, but it's not as important exactly what biomass is used for, as long as you take care of the carbon um, and capture it. Um, yeah, that's what that says, basically. Um, and so carbon capture strongly enhances the value of biomass. If you don't connect what you use biomass for with carbon capture, it reduces the value of biomass uh, compared to capturing it. Uh, there is one exception here, and that's uh, actually firm generation, which ends up not being run that much. And then it's not e economical to combine it with carbon capture, but it's still uh, a very valuable 
uh, service in the energy system. <clears throat> but generally, uh, the high capital expenditure of uh, carbon capture uh, leads to the system wanting to have high capacity factors, so high usage rates uh, of the technology. Um, and one final takeaway is that um, renewable chem chemicals and liquid fuels, that's the most challenging part of the system. So, and you'll see why. Um, so just a few words on, on the modeling. Um, we have used PIPSA EUR SEC, um, which is a very strong model. It's open source, so you can check it out. Um, so where we optimize both capacity and dispatch across all energy sectors. Um, it has a very high spatial and temporal resolution. Um, I mean, in the, in the picture here, you see a very high spatial resolution. We could not afford that here because we have introduced a lot of competition, uh, biomass competition in, in, in the whole system. So we had to reduce uh, the, tempor uh, the, the spatial resolution uh, to 37 nodes, which is still quite OK. And we had also a five-hour temporal resolution. And these are overnight scenarios. Uh, so we're not looking at the journey there, but we're looking at uh, a year where we are achieving the target. And in this case, we're focusing on a net negative target in the energy system. Um, so minus 110%. And we also limit the amount of carbon storage uh, that is allowed because that also uh, has a large effect on results. Um, and as I said, biomass competes in all sectors with other options. For instance, uh, for biofuels, we also have e-fuels. And, and, and for negative emissions, we also have direct air capture. Um, just shortly on the biomass assumptions, so we assume, basically we assume uh, residues to be used. So that's the orange part here. Uh, so this is the cost supply curve for biomass. Um, and then we can expand that by uh, more expensive uh, imports. Um, and we assume that all processes that we have for using biomass, they exist both with and without carbon capture, and the model basically chooses how to uh, use this technology. Um, yeah, and there's a substantial both infrastructure need, but also energy penalty for carbon capture that we assume. <coughs> um, just also as a primer in near optimal analysis, which is the method, method we're using here. Um, so basically, we're looking at the feasible solution space around the cost optimum. So usually models present a cost optimal result. Um, so which would be like the yellow dot here. Um, and that's like, that's the least cost solution to achieve um, a certain emissions target. Um, and in this case, on the y-axis, we have, for instance, the amount of biomass used. Um, but in our case, we then allow a higher system cost, an epsilon, uh, say 1% or 5%. Um, and then we minimize or maximize a, a specific option. For instance, again, biomass, um, and see how uh, sensitive the system is to this. Um, and then we can end up with different feasible solution spaces. So in this case, it's, it's a very narrow feasible solution space. So in effect, we have to use this technology, otherwise it becomes really costly. Um, but uh, it can also be very wide, so it doesn't really matter if we use this technology or not, because there are other options that can fulfill the same uh, service. So then we get to the results. Um, 
and we focus first on overall biomass usage in the energy system. Um, and we see that in the cost optimal, uh, least cost solution, we do have uh, some 3,500 terawatt hours of biomass uh, for all of Europe, um, which amounts to about 29% of the primary energy. Um, and the rest is uh, wind, solar, and a little bit of hydro. Um, and this um, then entails quite a bit of biomass imports in our assumptions. It could also be um, supplied by domestic residues. Uh, we have assumed a medium scenario for domestic residues, but as you see, the high residue potential here is quite close to our optimum uh, usage. But, but there is a lot of uncertainty and a lot of trade-offs involved here. Um, so, uh, yeah, which can be discussed. And, that, and that's why we also um, analyze lower levels of biomass. So, for instance, if we limit biomass to current usage, that would be about 5% higher system cost. Um, which is not maybe not that much considering uh, other trade-offs. Um, but we also find that biomass can be excluded only at a 20% higher system cost, um, which is about 170 billion euros per year, uh, quite similar to the defense spending in the EU. So it's uh, a substantial amount, um, which I think one should be aware of when deciding about these things. And actually, we can um, remove wind power from the energy system at the same uh, cost increase. Um, and this, um, I mean, we, we are assuming residues, uh, using residues. Um, if we have upstream emissions associated with this biomass usage, then we do have uh, the, the system reacts quite sensitively to this, uh, especially depending on uh, how much carbon storage we assume. Um, then moving on to bioenergy with carbon capture. Um, so in the, in the optimal uh, solution, we get about 900 megatons per year captured um, back, um, which is about 21% of the overall greenhouse gas emissions in Europe, uh, well, 2021. Um, so it's quite a substantial amount. Um, and almost all biomass usage is linked to carbon capture. As I said, with uh, one big exception, and that's firm generation which is, uh, we'll see later. Um, we can also exclude biomass uh, or biomass with carbon capture. So back at a 13% higher uh, system cost. And in that case, we do have a lot more uh, direct air capture. Um, and if we, do, if we do not use carbon capture, then this also uh, reduces the, the value of biomass a lot. So at this point, we could remove biomass at a 5% uh, system cost penalty. Um, but then obviously, we'd have to rely on direct air capture to provide negative emissions and, and uh, carbon. Um, we also find that we run sensitivities to, to this, and especially it's sensitive to what we assume for direct air capture costs and we find that even though we do have substantial um, energy penalties and costs involved for for BEC um, it is still competitive to to duck as it's less costly and uh, so there's quite a strong competition going going on there that may inhibit uh, direct air capture uh, deployment um, so going into more detailed uh, usage of, in this case, solid biomass, um, we see that in the cost optimum, uh, we have 
um, like most of the biomass, solid biomass is used to produce. Oh shit! <laughs> used to produce uh, biofuels, uh, and um, but we also see that there's a there's a quite a large span of solutions already within one percent. So this leads us to conclude that it's actually not as crucial what we use the biomass for as long as we uh, connect the process to carbon capture. Um, and just to uh, maybe this is the final slide, I guess. Um, <laughs> um, so th this is the, uh, the temporal uh, resolution um, of all of this. And we see that there is a lot of variability in the system, a, a lot of wind and solar. Uh, so below zero, sorry. Um, above zero, we have the, uh, the degeneration, electricity, and below zero, we have the um, consumption. And even though we do have a lot of flexible consumption, like electrolyzers and electric vehicles and vehicle grid and so on, we also assume uh, uh, like a base load. Um, and this, um, to provide this, the, the, we do actually obtain quite a lot of firm generation capacity, which has the capacity to provide all of this uh, base load. Uh, but it's barely used, so we have capacity factors of like two to eight percent. Um, so, in the end, not a lot of biomass goes to this purpose. Uh, but it's a very important service. It's hard to get out of the system. And I guess I'll end there. I'm not quite finished, but thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Marcus. Um, do we have any questions uh, in the room or online at all? Do we have any on? I don't know who's monitoring. Oh, yeah. Go, Tillman. Very short question. You, you used the term firm um, production, and actually I'm not sure what exactly you refer to. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a term used in a lot of, especially US um, research on, on this. Uh, so variation management, you can also call it. Um, so basically uh, capacity that is there and can fulfill demand at any point in time. It's not variable, like weather dependent. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You just talk about the capture, the CO two capture, and you didn't talk about the storage. So you say back and not back. So I think it's quite easy to to look at all the units using biomass for energy to see it's possible to put uh, capture. But then then you need to transport and store the CO two. Did you look to the location of this unit and if there is a match with the CO two geological storage? Um. No, it's not that detailed, especially in, in that sense. So we assume a cost for this. Um, yeah, but uh, that can definitely be improved. Um, but it's not only storage. We're, we're also, we have CCU and CCS. So that's why I say back, uh, because it's used, recirculated in the system, the carbon, and used for negative emissions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you for your questions. A round of applause again, please. <laughs> so, and we go ahead with our next speaker, uh, Tillman Schildhauer. He is from um, Paul Scherer Institute in Switzerland. He is a member of Task 44, and I think he will very well connect on the options with regard to uh, flexible and carbon capture related bioenergy. Yeah, thank you very much, Daniela, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, many of the things I'm talking, you heard about of the services which you can do for the energy system. Um, and I'm now trying a little bit to focus on the aspect of flexibility. And then one, the right one? No. Ah, the big green one. Oh, there was too big. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, yeah. The challenges of the energy system is a kind of clear. Huh? We have this interday mismatch in the electricity supply. 
um, PV comes um, in the middle of the day and we are all using the evening, so we have a mismatch over there. Um, we have a seasonal mismatch of, of energy supply, not only electricity, but energy supply. Um, also depending on in, in which altitude we are um, or which latitude, um, we would like to defossilize all kinds of sectors, industrial heat, transport, aviation, shifts, we heard all of that. And at the end, we need the negative emissions. And um, there's many, many, many options which we can do without even using biomass. I have to go closer. OK, thanks for the hint. Um, so there are many, many options which we can use without even touching biomass. Um, we should clearly be more efficient or even sufficient. Um, um, there could be demand side management. Um, we can use hydropower to store or delay the, uh, delay the water. Um, heat pumps, district heating, all kinds of things we can think of. Um, and we should also use all of that because we already heard several times this morning there's not enough biomass for everything. Huh? So we definitely need all that. And biomass now is something which we can use on top of that. Um, and the, the message which I would like to, to give here is actually what can we do with biomass? Actually, this is our wild card. It's really, really valuable. Huh? So if you use it in a clever way, because we can use it for everything, all of the services, and um, we can, for most of them, we can decide when we use it and what for we use it. So this is really something you cannot do with most of the other renewable energy sources. So something um, which is very valuable, but we should make a clever use of that because we don't have enough biomass for for everything. Huh? If you look a little bit into details, um, we heard it several times uh, this morning, we can actually use biomass plants to actually supply um, electricity when there is uh, not enough supplied by, by, by wind or PV or hydropower. Um, we know that these machines are extremely fast. You can go up, ramp up and down in minutes. Uh, would like I like to focus a little bit on this. Um, it also means that we need storages. We need to be able to have the bio uh, energy stored it's easy for pellets for pyrolysis oil, but for, for, for biogas that we have this inflatable roof um, um, digesters, which allow us to store for several hours. That is quite useful. Um, but on the other side, usually if you produce electricity, we also produce heat. And often we operate this type of systems according to the heat demand. Um, but if you build heat storages like this uh, hot water tower in, in Ling Shopping, um, you actually can actually decouple, decouple the heat um, supply from the time when you um, uh, produce electricity and this is quite quite useful because that gives you the full flexibility even more than if you just only um, 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 rely on ramping up and down biogas plants huh? so the storing of the heat is one of the keys which comes with an extra cost so same is if i am storing biogas for some time, it means my engine is a little bit larger than it would need to be um, if i were to operate on it steady state if you think a bit about the um, seasonal mismatch, it means we have to actually convert our biomass in something which can be stored and for which we have an infrastructure to store it and to, to, to supply it or to distribute over the landscape. And it's fully clear, we, we know how to do that for wood chips and, and pellets. Also pyrolysis oil is, is um, quite easy. We have a very good natural gas grid of most parts of Europe. So it makes sense to, to convert a lot of these um, biomass into into the gas grid because something which you can do right now uh, it works right away um we have seen if for, for biogas it's it's easy we have just to separate the co2 um if you do gasification then we have to do methanation there was a gobby gas project there was a european project bios ng we will hear this afternoon from uh, ng about new things um and in the future when we have hydrogen infrastructure also hydrogen definitely would be one of these energy carriers which are useful to to produce uh, by, by the way, the color code of these arrows is actually green is what is already happening, yellow is what works, but um, has not a business case yet, and it, red is the things which are somewhere on the way around uh, pilot, pilot scale at the moment. Um, actually, what I showed is that we have to remove CO2 if you produce these energy carriers, it has to do with the fact that biomass contains oxygen, the energy carriers don't contain oxygen, the oxygen has to go somewhere. And usually it's CO2, which we have to, have to take out and we give it to atmosphere. Or we add hydrogen and actually can convert all the carbon into more of our, of our energy carriers, which we would like to do. And then we actually get out the oxygen in the form of water from the system. Um, and that is actually quite a clever way um, to use um, electricity in, in, let's say, in summer when we have too much of it. And I'm even would exaggerate or 
put it to the point that we say, if we don't do that, if we don't create a value, value from electricity, then these large capacities of PV and wind, which we need to supply the energy system will not be built because it will be times nobody needs electricity, no value creation, um, then no investment. So I think biomass can be a really important role as an enabler to get these high capacities of, of PV and wind. Um, what you also can see immediately is that needs some flexibility because most probably we will have this electricity not all year, but only during uh, parts of the year. So we need also here technical flexibility that the plants can actually operate sometimes with hydrogen addition, sometimes without. Then we would like to defossilize everything, chemical industry, heavy transport, aviation fuels. Then it's clear we need a lot of uh, liquid fuels. Um, that could be right away fischer tropsch diesel, that could be methanol as intermediate for all kinds of chemicals or jet fuels, all these type of things. Um, many, many technologies. And again, you see um, with many of these chemicals and, and fuels, you have the option to add hydrogen when you have it. Or if you don't have hydrogen, you can actually take out CO2. Actually, you have to take out CO2. It's part of the, um, of the process already. It's already in the investment cost which we have for this type of process. So you get the CO2 in principle for free. Um, um, and that actually allows us to do a lot of negative emissions um, just from these processes. You could also pick up um, CO2 from these combustion processes, like I show at the end when we produce electricity and heat. Um, and you could also actually convert all, my, all bio, biomass into bio coal, where you then actually put the bio coal on, on a certain place, which is also a kind of, um, of negative, emission, negative emission, which you actually can do at many places, not only at very specific uh, CO2 sites, and uh, what we always should never forget, and uh, Oshara also showed that wooden buildings is one of the most um, wonderful way, or the material use of biomass, one of the most wonderful way of uh, uh, biomass sequestration. Um, so we have really, really many options. We can also see um, that sometimes we can add hydrogen, sometimes not. Then we can remove CO2 that actually allows us to build plants, which in some of the year, offer the service of um, taking up surplus electricity and producing more of the bi um, biomass or energy carriers. And other times you can actually use the same plants um, when you don't have hydrogen and separate CO2, which then available for, for negative emissions. So actually we can build plants um, which are very flexible for both services. And we did a cost calculation for that for based on a relatively small biogas plant um, where you would in some time of the year would se just separate the the CO2 by a membrane, and the other year, uh, the part of the year, you would um, um, actually add hydrogen, do, do methanation, power to gas. But we found out, depending on what is the value of the CO2 and what is the spread of the electricity cost between the lowest price, let's say in summer, and the highest price in winter, you get quite a different number of or shares of how much of your time um, you, you do the one or the other. Right? In the extreme case, we had half a year negative emission, half a year. Um, of, of power to gas, huh? depending on, on how these conditions are. So, so many things which we could do. What should we use that for? Um, Marcus already gave part of the answers. Also, Oshada this morning showed quite interesting uh, um, um, results, which I, I really appreciate a lot. Um, I made my, a little bit my thoughts. Um, I think it's a kind of clear, and many people thought there is no one fit all. Huh? So, we have very strong regional difference. It's a big, big difference. Um, um, which biomass do I have? What is my landscape? Can I transport that easily? Is this Scandinavian we are used to transport a lot? Or is this Central Europe? Am I close to a harbor where I can port things? It's really, really different. Um, also the times which we have. Um, and then what else is there in the energy system locally? Because we're not transporting all of the biomass around. As we heard this morning, there's a lot of water in that. Often enough, um, you don't want to transport that in Switzerland, where I come from, uh, wood chips, in principle, you don't want to transport more than 50 kilometers from the forest to, to the plant, not more. That gives you a complete different size of what you do in Scandinavia, just as an example. Huh? So then if you have already district heating or you don't have a district heating, it makes a big, big difference on what you should do with, with the biomass. Um, and if you have a gas grid, does it contain methane or already in 20 years that could be actually already filled with hydrogen? Uh, so there's a big, big difference what you should uh, choose for. 
is there somewhere an electrolyzer around which is happy to produce more and give you some hydrogen in summer? Is there maybe a waste incineration plant which anyway has to get rid of CO2 and offers you the CO2 logistics? So it's completely depending on, on, your, on the local things because biomass is not so easy transportable. Then we have variations in time. We have this example which I, which I mentioned. Um, you could build a plant which um, some part of the year does power the gas and the other uh, or power the X and the other part of the year does, does BEX. Um, and there could also be, if you think about the change of the energy system, huh? a typical example is um, the gas grid is already there, there is methane, there are many appliances at the moment which work with fossil natural gas, um, cars or domestic heating, we could just defossilize right away if you now produce bio, uh, bio, um, biomethane actually and inject it. But maybe in 20 years we want to slowly get rid of that, also get rid of domestic heating based on, on, on gas. But maybe your plant is still there, but maybe based on the gasification, then you might want to be able to turn it into a hydrogen production uh, plant. Huh? So we should think about these things. Um, then the last thing is about market regulations, incentives clearly needed, uh, because the, as I uh, try to show, things cost a little bit more. So we need incentives and clever market regulations. But given this big variety of the local region, um, uh, of the, the local boundary conditions, um, we should make sure that regulations don't are not created for one certain situation and then they don't fit for the, all the other ones so that we don't block certain technologies in, in, in certain regions. And that brings me to my last slide, hopefully still in time. Um, okay, biomass is a wildcard. We can do all kinds of, of, of system services, um, peak demand, seasonal storage and negative emissions. Um, again, I, won't, I would like to point out, I think to really enable the large capacities of, of PV and wind, um, we need value creation for that. And biomass, or actually the CO2 from biomass, would be a perfect starting point. So I see here a clearly enabling role. Um, we talked about the market, market regulations. There's still technology development to be done. So we need to be more flexible. As I mentioned, we should also be more efficient in small scale because most of the technologies are really efficient in large scale, but in small scale not. So we should work on that. It's actually something I'm going to do tomorrow when I'm back um, or continuing. Um, and then there's the modeling. If you want to make the things more flexible and we want to understand what's the flexibility of, of this um, helps of the system, the flexibility should be represented correctly in the models. Um, otherwise, we will never learn about it. And um, yeah, as I mentioned, most probably the optimal solution is very different from place to place. And with that, I would like to thank for your attention. Very last uh, um, advertisement, the task 44 has a best practice homepage where you can see real plants, which at least try to re realize some of the aspects I, I mentioned so far. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Tillman. Oh. I'm starting for the uh, quite uh, clear overview on the technologies and options. Are there questions? Axel. I think I'm. Yes, it's another one. Thank you for that very nice presentation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, thank you for a very, very nice presentation. Um, I'm glad you touched the aspect of the role of biomass how, and how it can change over the transition. So something that we would need today might be different in 10 years. But understanding that um, these are time scales that might be much shorter than the running and operational time of a plant. Um, have you considered these facts and might there be uh, the need to actually support this kind of transitional flexibility in terms of incentives? Yeah, so we have a little bit thought tactic about it. I mean, if you, let's say we have a biogas plant, as long as there's a gas grid, you produce biomass and it's very easy. If it is gone, then you have the choice either go into LNG, and first bit is a liquid form. So if the gas grid is either gone or it's filled with hydrogen, or you have to think about uh, then adding a steam reformer, which just, just would add costs. Um, if you think about a gasification plant, you might think already from the beginning, maybe for the next 10, 15, 20 years, I produce methane, so you put a methanation. But what should I have? Or what I should at least prepare as a plant that maybe one day I want to put their water gas shift and rather run than uh, um, an hydrogen production from that. Uh, but then already more or less in the next investment cycle, we have to think of um, 
how should we build the plant differently and at least prepare things that we are not completely locked, um, that we can do um, um, easy adaptations. Huh? And to be honest, I think we need also to, 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 to prepare that because otherwise nobody will invest the technologies that we can use already tomorrow because people are afraid that these changes come faster than typical depreciation time of, of such a plant and they're not going to invest again and again we are locked huh? so we think should think in, in a very dynamic way huh? this is like if you're on a, on a highway you always think ahead what should, what happens next how should i should i behave and this is what we should do also with our investment our technology development okay there would be time for a very short second question any online yeah, maybe is there an online question? No. Okay, so it's good to hear. Tell me all the open points are solved. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and now it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Christiana Hennig, uh, who is from the Department of Biomass in the Energy System at the German Biomass Research Center. So Christian, over to you. Thank you, Zoe. Can you hear me loud and clearly? Excellent. So with my presentation, I want to give you some insights what we are doing at IA Bioenergy directly in terms of BECs and BEC here. So I'm super happy to have all these previous speakers that already gave you a glance of this, uh, how valuable uh, CCS or also CCU can be. So the idea is to give you really an overview of our activities and also some findings and results that we have within the studies that we're doing. So what we can see is that most of the like governments or many of the governments see CCS as one of the part of the strategies to really go to the net zero road uh, down the road. So this is really on the agenda. And this brings, of course, the question uh, how to facilitate this and how to actually go into deployment. And this is also the core of our activity that we are doing. Uh, what I put here is that just to differentiate on the one thing, because for many things also they hear CCS, CCU, so we are talking about BECs, so it's Bioenergy plus CCS, so it's not the fossil. I think this is also something very important because only with this we can get our negative emissions that we want. As you see on the right hand side of the graph, I think it's really a good graph if someone needs wants uh, some explanation from the outside uh, world of bioenergy to explain where the difference is between BECs and the other CCS applications. Coming back to our uh, carbon removals, so there are two main uh, CDR methods that you can see here. They're often referred to as natural or techno technological methods, but this is also still under debate. Some say it should be rather more ecosystem-based service or ge geochemical uh, services, and this is something that is still under research. So what is BEX as one of these carbon removal technologies? So what we can see that there is a lot of backup in the morning already that was mentioned many times. I chose here the example of the European Commission, so you can see here uh, that this uh, BECs and uh, related ducts has been also taken up also by the Commission uh, in their communication of sustainable carbon cycles, that this is one of the activities that should be support, uh, supported under carbon removals. Uh, so it has been an acknowledgement not only on the national level in some countries in Europe and also worldwide, but also on EU level. And I just wanted to put this uh, point this out again. Uh, so this brings us to where we stand with our work at IEA Bioenergy. So our motivation was if we have now so many uh, of these scenarios and so many of these plans, so actually we need this deployment. And there is this gap between I have a plan and I want to have it implemented. So what we want to do is that we want to uh, provide guidance. So how can you do some transition? And here we have an approach that we, on the one hand, uh, want to gather a group of experts, or we did this, of course, uh, who are involved in these first of its kind projects. So that have either the contact to the companies or the setup of governments, or they are, they are representing the company or having the linkage. And on the other hand, uh, having like the whole picture of what would it mean to implement an CCS in the uh, system. So this is the 
the second part of this um, analysis that we were doing. So, and all together, this of course should help to support for good governance so that, you know, these are the options. These are the options that are now at the projects. These are maybe the future options. And these are the obstacles and challenges to integrate it into the energy system. This brings us back now to our uh, IA bioenergy activity. I thought it would be really worthwhile to show it to the audience. Um, so this is the setup of IA bioenergy. Uh, our work is related uh, to different technical or technology options and on system options. And then this is grouped in different tasks. As you can see here, maybe I try to use the pointer. So these are the different circles, system perspective, going down then to conversion and technology and resources. And I just wanted to show you, uh, when we're talking about BECS, you can see that many of these tasks, like mostly all of them are related or needed for realizing a deployment of BECS. So the activity is coordinated by Task 40, uh, which I'm part of and uh, co-leading. It's bio-based deployment. And we're having this Beckis Intertask project. But all these tasks that you see here that are uh, circled uh, red, they're participating. So you need all of these different actors to realize this uh, topic. So how is the project structured? Uh, we already started in 2019. So it's running already for some time. And uh, we uh, divided it in two phases. So you can see this here. So these are just some few information on the project itself. But just that you see that there is a history. So we had a phase one. And in phase one, we started with first case studies and system studies. And then we're moving to phase two, seeing, OK, these are some further technologies that need to be considered or new projects uh, were coming up. Uh, and further system questions are appearing. This is not that I want to now show you how nicely we structure work packages. I kept this in the presentation to basically show you something else. And this is the link to other actors and related TCPs. And I thought this is worthwhile telling also that you saw it from the previous speakers. So we don't only need IEA Bioenergy, we also need the others. So this is like greenhouse gas emissions. This is energy system modeling for integrating it into the energy system. They are looking into more biorefineries or industrial technologies. So you, it just shows the complexity of this topic uh, when you want to make it uh, run and deploy CCS. So this is the overview that you get an idea which technologies we are having on board at the moment. Sorry, I wanted to have this. So this is the, from the phase one. You see that we covered here a lot on uh, also electricity production, bioethanol and waste. And now in this current one, we look into gasification and more also into um, technologies that uh, are maybe at some cases also lower tier L. As a, also here we have some cases that are maybe need some modeling. So we were trying to rely always on current projects that are running, but we also need some modeling. So and this brings me to this project, um, just to give you an idea um, what is out there. Sorry. I just want to So these are, I call it project examples, but just this tells that uh, uh, we have these different companies either on board with an AI, IEA Bioenergy, or we have good linkages. So we are able as sample cases to show how they're realizing it. As an example, I was adding here uh, the current project of REWE. So they are doing currently a restructuring of the AMR plant and MSAVE, and there they are planning to construct a capture unit. And uh, the construction is supposed to start in 2025, and operation is expected in 2029 and 2030. And they both combined of these power plants, they want to have a capture rate of 11 to 14 million tons of uh, CO2 per, per year. So this is going to, if they realize it, uh, a really uh, huge project. Um, and this is just one of the examples. So what we can see in the last one, two years, suddenly there are more and more activities are coming up. And this makes our work even more really needed uh, to give this guidance for, for transition. So this is my last slide. <laughs> um, 
I divided it into like sets of key levels, two pillars. Um, the one is the policy. We saw it all the time. We need the policy. Uh, what we saw so far is that at the moment we have clusters uh, appearing. So we have some countries um, that are really proactive, uh, both in their policy, then of course linked with the industry to move ahead with doing tendering, with giving investment funds. Uh, and then these clusters, uh, sometimes they're also in the case of Scandinavia, I list them here as an example with uh, Denmark, uh, Sweden and Norway, then they also get closer together. And then you also see that also also smaller companies join and also are interested in CCS. So you have these uh, clusters uh, appearing. And then I put it on the technology and energy, energy system level, and it links very nicely to the two presentations that we heard before from Marcus and Tillman. Um, the first that we see from our case that we are, we are seeing, you see, you really need these models for on-ground deployment. You, see, you need business cases because many companies that are then supposed to do the carbon capture, they still see the option of utilization. So the question is often out there to utilize or to store, but this is rather a business model for them. So if we want to have storage, they need then the guidance and the support by the government. So this is the, the key issue if you want to go for this. So if it's attractive or via the carbon credits, then of course you will see more storage. But this is just to make aware of this, that there are many things with the CC. That's why I liked it with what Marcus did, that he stopped after the CC, just to say there is more than to look at. Uh, so that is challenging because maybe you don't end up where you want to be. And, uh, and the last thing I wanted to highlight is this complexity. And this, I think, also Tillman showed. So when you really want to have the CCS, you also have to realize that there are many other things needed by the energy system and also maybe provided by bioenergy. So if you go for flexibility, then maybe you will have less or most likely you will have less carbon captured because your plant is not running like full load hours. So you will end up with a different capture rate. So you have to be aware of what would this mean. So in the end, we are now increasing even complexity. So biomass, bioenergy is super complex. Uh, it has been. And now I think with this, we are even entering <laughs> some more, but I think the value question will help. So I think if we add value to these different activities, so if the carbon has the value and we think we're moving to a carbon economy, then I think BEX is something that will be linked there. Uh, and if we add value to flexibility, it also answers. So I think it's rather also fact uh, to more research. So this was all I think I, and I know I went over time. So the last slide is also just some advertisement. So if you're interested, you can see the first reports of what we were doing. Uh, so all the case studies that are out and the first system considerations. So thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, uh, Christiana. It was uh, perfectly to time. Uh, do we have any questions uh, in the room or anybody online? It was very clear. Oh, yeah. Do you want to? Uh, there's one next to you. Just there. Yeah, thank you for the nice presentation. My question is uh, with regard to the different case study. Um, do you think you get a broad enough overview on, on the case studies, or do you see there, let's say, there are up, additional upcoming? Uh, concepts uh, which needs more consideration from your point of view. Uh, thank you very much. A very nice question, um, because I think we need both. Uh, we would be happy to have even more global coverage. So you saw it's also a bit uh, European driven my presentation. So we do have a lot of uh, information from the US, what is really helpful and our US colleagues and our tasks are doing a really good job and presenting their, their bioethanol activities. But this is something that we definitely should look into, uh, this uh, more country coverage. In terms of technologies, I think we're doing really well. Uh, we are covering rather many, many concepts and I think the number of concepts that we're covering so far is maybe a question or, of capacities. 
So to cover all of them, it's just like it takes a while. <laughs> and we already identified that we definitely should go into biorefineries as well. We identified it already for now, but we just uh, need more time to move to this. Uh, and also what we discussed the last day is also biochar should be definitely something that uh, we should mention there and look into into this further and we do have the experts in our uh, group at IAA Biology is something that we already identified so we have already kind of drafted the next uh, project in our head thank you thank you uh any other questions I may ask you a very quick one because we're a little yes, bit ahead of time. Of course, sorry. Uh, so I, I was involved in this process, so I'm, I I'm familiar. <laughs> um, I guess from the different case studies, do you have any sense of how much these industries are talking to each other yeah. about how they are going to get a business case together? Yes, um, in clusters, they do and start. So if it's a region, uh, we just recently had a workshop. Uh, also, this was someone is interested. There was a workshop on small and large scale combustion combined with CCS or CCU. And uh, there it was like very, I think, uh, an easy process for our partner in, in Denmark to get the people together at one table. So people are connected when they are in their clusters and they're working together. So it was like a group from, again, Sweden, Norway, Denmark that was on the spot. The others were, of course, uh, then connecting, but they were all present. So they were all joining the event in person. And if you are in a cluster, then it is there. Outside the cluster, I think it's more uh, challenging um, if they leave it there. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much, Christian. Oh, is it very, very quick? <laughs> very, very quick. <laughs> Yeah, uh, my quick question is, uh, uh, we can, uh, we might uh, uh, categorize into CCS, CCU, and CCUS. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you compare which one is better <laughs> in terms of the cost effectiveness? Oh, cost effectiveness. Uh, well, this is, a, this, this is what we mean with business case. So if you have like good pricing with the carbon, then uh, with the carbon credits, I think then most of them would go for the storage. I think this is the answer. But so before, like a few years back, most of them would have gone in utilization. So I think it's really the value of the carbon is, is the key. Um, but we see now more moving into CCS. Um, but it's again something, also some regional issue. So some say, oh, why should I do the S? The U is super because I have the industry around me. So they take my, my carbon and it's also something I can do. So if they get a certain price from the industry around, they don't care about the carbon credits they see, because sometimes it's easier for them to do this because this would be a new field of operations. This is what we see from, from smaller actors. Thank you very much, Christiane. Yeah, following this uh, quite nice uh, discussion, I think this is a perfect uh, introduction of our next speaker, Christopher Gaelic. He's a professor at North Carolina State University, and we should see him in a second at the screen. Okay. Can you see me? Are we here? Yeah, now we see you. Uh, can, can you see us too? I can see you and I can see me seeing you. Okay. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much for joining all, uh, us here and bringing the insights in on carbon accounting and backwards value chains. The floor is yours. Okay. Oh, so that, that answers my question. How is the presentation going to be going? Are you advancing it from your end or how should this work? As far as I understood, uh, you just uh, say next slide, right? Okay, that, that works. So I apologize for not being able to be there in person. I was in Zurich last week and couldn't um, unfortunately extend the stay, but I really appreciate the invitation. Um, I'm gonna be speaking for just a few minutes this morning on carbon accounting. This work comes from um, uh, some work in, in biogenic accounting we've been doing with biomass, generally speaking, for over a decade and a half. But a lot of the specific things you're going to see here comes from a report that we worked on with the Energy Future, Futures Initiative um, last year. And so I just want to acknowledge the work by uh, Robert Apt, 
uh, Ambar Tuska and Justin Baker, um, who may have worked with some of you in the past. Um, so the first thing that I'd, I'd like to mention is um, this was the title that was provided, and I think it works. The only uh, change I would suggest is if you could advance is um, advance the slide, please is that uh, I tend to refer things in, in the VEX context. Um, and that is just shorthand, it's an unfortunate shorthand, but I find myself slipping back to that. So just for the purposes of today's talk, please please consider this to be an all encompassing term, including um, both the capture uh, for use as well as for storage purposes here. Next slide, please. So a lot of the work that I'm going to speak to was informed by things we did several years back, and this has to go to the heart of biogenic accounting, which I think, again, for Bex is incredibly relevant. And for example, we did some work, uh, the analysis that went into this is probably about 15 years old at this point, but we were looking at um, some of the accounting um, driven changes we were seeing in the literature and in the popular media um, about the influence of bioenergy on greenhouse gas emissions. And what we decided to do was to use singular model output. So we generated using a, a forest model of the Southeast United States to generate changes in uh, forest composition. And that includes both the extent of forests, but also the types of forests that are being managed and how intensely they're being managed in response to an increase for bioenergy in the US state of Virginia. And what we decided to do was parse those data based only on geographic scope. So we shocked the system with uh, an increased amount of bioenergy demand. And then we simply looked at, uh, depending on different perspectives, how that would add up in terms of net emissions or uh, sequestration. And we looked at that across several different levels. We looked at it at the uh, individual forest stand level. We looked at it at the individual landowner level. And that's, you can see this really dark, um, this county that's uh, in Eastern Virginia, That that's about, uh, the forest in that area is about what we would consider to be a large landowner. Um, we looked at a supply shed, so a woodshed, so the amount of area that would be feeding a particular facility, that's that uh, darker gray area. And then we, we accounted for it at the state level. So what would the landscape level implications be of an increase in demand? Next slide, please. And then all we did was um, both look at the scale, the differences across scale, but then we also said, well, what if these bioenergy facilities needed to report a singular number? So rather than having to report something that was different every year, they had to somehow compress all of their emissions and sequestration into a, a singular number that captured, say, 15 years or 30 years of emissions or sequestration. So there's different ways to account for those numbers and throw them together. What we found was that singular scenario, depending on how you accounted for it, including both how you crunched the numbers and the geographic extent that you included in your calculations, was either a net emissions, and that's above zero here, or a net reduction, and that's very much below. And you can see that this very much changed. Um, actually, I flipped that. I'm sorry. So a net greenhouse gas benefit, which is above zero, or um, or net emissions, which is shown here as, as below zero. This was in a carbon debt context. And what you can see here is that if you're doing it at the landscape level, that the system actually showed small but beneficial uh, greenhouse gas outcomes. If you're accounting it at the forest plot level, um, that's far right here, it's showing very strong carbon debt. Um, very negative outcomes from a greenhouse gas mitigation standpoint. And that is something that continues to influence my thinking in a lot of this. And if you can go to the next slide, please. Because when it comes to BEX, this is not necessarily an easy thing to do, um, not only for the cost of the technology, but the associated infrastructure, be it pipelines and storage, and then all the regulations that need to be um, either interpreted or actually written in order to implement it. And so I strongly believe this, that as first and foremost, a strategy for deep decarbonization, that any attempt to expand this will require uh, confidence in the greenhouse gas mitigation potential associated with this use. And I think that that applies to both the scientific side, what we as the scientific community uh, see to be the case, but also treatment under relevant policy. And I think that it's important to acknowledge that that need not be the same, that we can have an agreement on what things mean from a scientific perspective, but also need to look at that through the lens of, of policy as to how it achieves those ancillary goals of um, moving the needle towards deep decar decarbonization. Next slide, please. 
So one thing I think is important when we're talking about accounting is to acknowledge both the uncertainty in emissions, but also uncertainty in how we're accounting. So if we look at this across the x-axis, um, there are different pools or different categories that we can be considering. And I should acknowledge um, some recent work by IEA on, on um, bio CCUS accounting, particularly the challenges of accounting for the, um, the use side of the equation. But one of the accounting considerations is simply what are you including in your math? Are you including everything from indirect land use change all the way through market rebounds where you're perhaps changing the economics of the entire energy system and need to account for, say, changes in fossil uh, generation that's induced by your installation of BEX? The other thing to account for is this vertical variation and that some of these are very easy to determine. We have a lot of experience in calculating, say, process emissions, but there are other things that are either very uncertain or they can vary widely. And I think the feedstock production side, particularly in my experience in forestry, is, is really relevant in this case and provides, I think, an area for, um, for future work and, and attention here. Next slide, please. And what this adds up to is a series of, of challenges. And the first that I would mention is continuing public distrust and strong scientific debate surrounding the accounting of biogenic stocks generally. Um, this isn't simply a biomass equation, but prior to working in bioenergy, I was working quite a bit in carbon offsets. And I think in any time we're talking about um, natural climate solutions these days, um, particularly carbon offsets, there are strong questions about um, the uh, whether those reductions are real and additional. Um, so it's not simply a bioenergy question, but I think it extends to all elements, whether it's biofuel, biodiesel, bioethanol, um, forest biomass, carbon offsets. These are questions that are, are not going away anytime soon and I think are a critical challenge to increasing the confidence of industry um, and policymakers to provide the incentives to put um, large-scale BECs into, into practice. The other thing I'll mention from an accounting perspective is that multiple layers of reporting complicate the transmission of incentives along an accounting chain. Uh, so, for example, we have individual facilities that operate, um, but these individual facilities have potentially global implications. So, if we're scaling BECs, particularly to the level that we see in some of the IPCC projections that are necessary to really achieve some of our climate objectives, there needs to be incentives all along the supply chain and at all stages of accounting, whether that's an individual feedstock provider or some of these national determined contributions, national uh, level accounting that allow these incentives to be transmitted in a way that achieve those very real greenhouse gas reductions that we need. And the last thing that I'll mention is a challenge is that BEX, and this includes again both the storage and the, the use side of things, shares challenges is with carbon dioxide removal technology more broadly, including direct air capture, but also renewable pathways. And if we're talking about things like market rebound and trying to track the change on the fossil side of the equation, what does installation of a new facility do to the induced production of fossil elsewhere? There needs to be consistent treatment to avoid implicitly favoring pathways. I think this is particularly important here in the US. And again, some of my comments here are primarily from a US perspective where I'm more familiar. Um, we have tax credits, uh, such as the 45Q tax credit that provide incentives for carbon capture and storage. But then the question becomes then how does a direct air capture system compete fairly with a BEX system given the uncertainty on the biogenic side of, of the equation here? Next slide, please. And I have honestly no earthly idea how long I've been talking. So um, please do step in if I'm exceeding my time here. The other thing that I'll mention here on the opportunity side is, and this is a little bit of the optimist side, realizing I don't have many minutes to talk here, but um, our work has indicated that there are obviously multiple policies uh, already on the ground with the potential to influence the accounting and allocation of removals across a BEX supply chain. This doesn't need to be created from, from scratch. And precedent also exists in accounting approaches for traditional bioenergy, both biopower and also liquid biofuels. These have seen to some extent controversy, um, but have, particularly in the case of the US biofuel industry, have been in place for uh, 15 years or so at this point and have continued to function. We're still not seeing the level of investment in biofuels that I think the writers of those particular laws had expected, but the implementing regulations are at least functioning um, to some extent. However, we can also see some 
uh, challenges, such as uh, an effort by our Environmental Protection Agency several years ago to twice determine biogenic emissions um, accounting strategies. Um, and so it, I think, exposes some continual challenges here in the accounting side. But there are things we can lean on, whether that is the uh, California Low Carbon Fuel Standard. Um, I think the the upcoming um, work by Vera and also, I believe, uh, under the biomass strategy at the, in the UK to start to take a tough look at some of the accounting challenges, that there are mechanisms by which we can start to think about how to do uh, proper accounting under BEX. The other thing I'll mention is that feedstock transport and energy fuel production processes and other direct emissions are fairly well understood. Um, and there may be a possibility to, for the time being at least, to develop simplified accounting kind of off ramps that provide um, more of a direct path for certain facilities that don't really get to some of those challenging dimensions that I mentioned earlier in the talk. And this might include things like waste or residues. And I put residues here. I should have put it in, in quotations because the definition of residues is itself a challenging thing to figure out. Next slide, please. And so it's just some parting thoughts, some, some brief parting thoughts based upon both specific work in Bex that we've done also, but, but, um, but you know, longer term um, biogenic accounting more broadly. Um, my training is an institutional scholar, and so I'm I'm always keen to uh, follow the path of the of the institutions that already exist. And so, what I would suggest is, first of all, to consider building on existing approaches. So, rather than creating some new thing um, out of whole cloth, to try to figure out ways that we can leverage existing accounting approaches that have received public support, that have some degree of public familiarity. Uh, to try to determine how best to to govern this particular system. Of course, that risks um, particularly, um, potentially biasing against new or potentially superior approaches, but I think time is of the essence. And frankly, the benefit of new quote unquote better solutions may be, um, maybe less so um, compared to something that we may be able to operationalize relatively quickly. And the last thing, and this is somewhat hard for me to say, but uh, consider taking the easy way out for now. I'm usually one to jump into the tough questions right away. But I think in the, in the case of Bex, I'm continually trying to solve the challenging things with the biogenic side um, and all the uncertainty and animosity that comes in that side, um, from that side of the equation. I'm currently involved in quite a few um, pellet greenhouse gas conversations uh, here in the state right now. Um, that we may be wasting valuable time trying to figure out the perfect approach for that, where there may be other approaches that could work for um, for pathways that perhaps have less indirect or market level impacts, such as waste or again residues. I did quote it on this side, on this slide, um, because again, Bex is not just the combustion side, but there's so many other parts of the system that we need to um, gain familiarity with and experience with. Um, if we're talking about pipelines, that is something that is incredibly contentious here in the U.S. right now. And so that's a whole other thing to, to deal with. If we're talking about storage and, and public comfort and familiarity with storage applications outside of the few pilot projects we've seen, that's going to take time and experience in order to gain traction. So I think there are other things that need to be worked out besides the accounting um, that, that would benefit from some quick action uh, on the ground beyond the few pilot projects we've already seen. So this is the last I believe minute. that is my last slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Pardon Thank me? You. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just wanted to, to, to give you the sign. This is the this is a, um, last minute. So everything was perfect. Okay. And, uh, so there we, we go. And hopefully you also heard the applause here in the room. And now the, the my, my question is, are there any questions? Peter. Speaking sadly as the person responsible for improving the UK sustainability requirements you mentioned earlier, um, how do you see the ability of society to accept counterfactual forest carbon stories both in terms of woodlot use and the other end of it which is the substitution benefits of the 
product fuel from Bex when additionality is hard to prove sometimes with the new plant. Thank you. Well, that's that is a um, it's a good question. <laughs> um, I think there's frankly some challenges. Um, I think there there are particularly when we're talking about forests, and that's when that's my perspective. There's more to play than just the the carbon side of the equation. There's just the all the other things that come with the forested landscape, um, particularly here in the southeast. The flashpoint is over. Um, pellet production for um, for transport to to Europe. Um, it's going to be challenging. I think, frankly, I'm a social scientist. Um, I think there are challenges within the scientific community between natural scientists and social scientists, particularly economists and ecologists. I would say that provide, I think, um, a microcosm of that challenge that. Um, both are looking at the same forested landscape, but with different perspectives, both have valuable insight, but um, but seem to be at loggerheads in terms of how to combine that insight in ways that um, are informative of a larger picture. And I think that extends to the, the public dialogue. Um, I'm quite pessimistic, to be honest. Um, I still think for the reasons that were mentioned in the previous speakers, um, that this has tremendous implications, not only in the near term for providing critical grid services as we scale up. Um, there's not a lot of options before batteries really come online um, to be able to offset some of the intermittency with solar and wind, um, particularly in the US. Again, we're having trouble running long transmission lines to access that intermittent power where it may be available. And so we're seeing a lot of natural gas deployment instead. And so what I think personally, um, and this is professionally and also just personally, um, based upon my involvement in the issue over the years, is that that is the trade-off that may perhaps drive some of the tougher conversations, that it's not so much bioenergy for bioenergy or, or additionality in forests for, for that sake, but rather the trade-off of, but what would we have to do besides? And I think in that context of not necessarily do I support this in absolute, in, in, its, in isolation, but rather, if I'm doing this or that, and the other thing is a 30 to 40 year commitment to a natural gas facility, be it liquefied natural gas for export or a domestic um, combined cycle power plant. Um, I think that's where the conversation changes a little bit personally, because it forces that hard trade off of which challenge am I, am I what I prefer to see. Yeah, thank you, Christopher, for this insight. And I think you really catched up on discussions we had here already during the last days. <laughs> Yeah, thank you again for this uh, contribution. Yeah, and I'm sorry my face is so big. <laughs> it's not this big in person, I promise. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, and so it's my pleasure to introduce the final speaker of this session. Uh, we are running a little bit over time, but we need to give all the speakers an opportunity. So we will run a little bit into your coffee break. Do bear with us. Uh, so <laughs> there's no rush. You have your time allocated, so okay. no rush at all. Uh, so our next speaker is uh, Aisha L. Kamlishi. Uh, from <laughs> uh, Adame, who is a technical coordinator in bio-based products and biofuels. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, thank you. So hello everyone. So yes, my name is Aishel Kamishi. I'm working uh, at ADEM uh, uh, within the Department of Bioeconomy and Renewable Energy. And this work, I would present a work that um, we done with my colleague from industry department. So it's on behalf of them, they did the main work uh, but i will uh, present for for them uh, today the, this uh, topic so it's this one okay mm -hmm. yes thank you so the the topic it's um, it's about the decarbonization target <laughs> we talk a lot today about uh, how to decarbonize uh, with bioenergy and so the questions that we we had what we assume uh, within ADEM is to say we don't have enough biomass to produce biofuel to, um, to reach the target that was set up uh, within uh, Europe um, about SAF, so the aviation sectors, and uh, the shipping sector. So the question was to say, if we don't have enough biofuel, do, uh, will, 
do we or will we will we have or yes we will have enough uh, electricity if we want to produce um, synthetic fuel uh, based on uh, electricity so sorry i didn't uh, uh, have a slide on e-fuel but we will have in the next session a presentation on advanced uh, fuels and synthetic fuels so it's uh, what i calling synthetic fuel it's uh, hydrogen uh, combined with CO2, so hydrogen from uh, electrolysis, uh, combined with CO2 to produce uh, synthetic fuel, so methane, uh, jet fuel, uh, methanol, uh, what do you want? So the question was to say, if we don't have enough uh, bi biomass for biofuel, there is enough electricity if we want to, to complete with uh, electrofuel. So you can see that we, we will use the target that um, I say it was set up by the European Commission. Uh, the scope of this work will be only on uh, maritime uh, or shipping sector and aviation. We didn't look to the other sector, so it's uh, only on uh, jet fuel and on the e-fuel use for maritime. So maritime is more complicated. We have several options, so we look to the methanol, ammonia, and also methane. And um, I think I will not have time to go in the detail of the scenarios that we used, but we didn't model, um, we didn't use a model, dedicated model for this work because within ADEM we already um, worked on uh, uh, prospective uh, works that Emily uh, uh, talk or introduced this morning during the introduction. So the, the name of this work is Transition 2050, and the, this work was uh, what mean neutrality uh, carbon for France by 2050. So, so we use this work and we also, so it's what we call the low demand scenario, but we, we look also at what will be the need if we are going to a higher demand and so for that we we based our work on the roadmap from sector so the in france we ask each sector to to do a roadmap on the neutrality and so we we use this uh, number for the high demand and also the um, other hypothesis that we, we we took it was about the technical assumption we, we need to because we will uh, need to calculate the energy efficiency, etc. We need to have technical assumption, and so we we base the work on the conservative uh, assumption. So the performance, the technical performance today of these processes to produce e-fuel or electrofuel, and we try to to um, to modelize with optimistic uh, uh, assumption. It means if we improve this technology because we are looking to 2050, what will be the electricity and CO2 need. So unfortunately, like I told you, I will not have time to precisely uh, detail the modelized scenarios, but if you have questions, you can come to me and we'll publish this work very soon. So the next one, it's so the first question that we we had to answer if we want to calculate to the estimate the need of uh, biogenic CO2 and electricity was the first question, what will be this demand of e-fuel by 2050? So uh, here you can see, I don't know if you can use, yes, the current demand of each sector, so for the aviation and for the maritime. Aviation, we are around uh, 56 terawatt -hour, and for maritime, we are around 12 terawatt -hour of energy consumption. Um, to calculate this uh, demand for 2050, we like what I told you, we base on the low demand scenario, we, um, we pick one uh, pathway of transition 2050, uh, because in this work we had four pathways. We say it's not possible to, to guess what will be the pathway to uh, carbon neutrality, so decided, we decided to work on four pathways. So we took this uh, uh, scenario two, where the main lever was the reduced demand of um, uh, fuels for, uh, for aviation. So you can compare. Here we have uh, 56 uh, terawatt -hour currently, and by 2050, in our scenario, we need only uh, around 30 terawatt -hour of uh, fuels to, to comply to, to the total demand. 
Um, in the high demand scenario, it's another work that we have done within ADEM, but with an external partner and also with the actor of the sector, so the aviation uh, actors. And you can see here the demand is around 70 terawatt hour because, of course, the, um, what they are seeing, the, the main actor of the, of the, of the aviation is as it is that the traffic will be increasing uh, in the future year, and they didn't see any decreasing of the traffic. So we, we pick this uh, uh, scenario to calculate the, the demand and um, to calculate the need of e-fuel, because e-fuel will not uh, be the only uh, fuel to, to comply to this uh, decarbonization target. Like I told you, there is advanced uh, biofuel also. But to calculate the share of e-fuel, we, we choose the target imposed by refuel EU aviation. So it is 70% sustainable fuel, and the share of e-fuel, it's uh, only 70, uh, 35%. So with this number, we could reach, uh, we could estimate the, the need of uh, jet fuel by 2050 in France. And I forgot to say, the main exception is there is no importation. All the fuel that we need will be produced in France. So it was the main, um, the, the main hypothesis. It could be challenges, but the idea is to say what will be the need of electricity and CO2 if we want to produce all this fuel in France. So in the low demand scenario, it's uh, 10 terawatt hour, and in the high demand scenario, we are, we are around 25 terawatt hour of e-fuel. Uh, we did the same calculation for uh, maritime sector. It's more complicated but because in this uh, in the shipping um, uh, sector, we we have many possibilities we we don't know which one will be used by the main actors they, they are they are still discussing so there is a um, boat with uh, that will be running using methane you, there is also discussion about methanol there is also discussion about ammoniac so we we did an, um some we take some uh, we took some assumption on the share of each uh, e-fuel to determine will, uh, what will be the need of electricity and CO2. But you can see from um, uh, shipping uh, sector, we are around 10 terawatt hour, and for the high demand scenario, uh, 30 terawatt hour. So this is uh, what we will need of uh, e-fuel by 2050 for these two sectors. So then we, 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 calculate, uh, we calculated the energy consumption because like what I told you, the production of e-fuel is uh, quite intensive in terms of electricity. Uh, I will not go into the detail, detail of the um, assumptions that we, we, we made, but just to focus on, uh, if, on the jet fuel. So it is the reaction of a Fischer trop. So what I say for the hydrogen in France, we assume that it will be produced only by electrolysis, so based on electricity. So we had to take uh, assumption optimistic or conservative on the yield of the electrolysis. And uh, for the um, fischer trap reaction, we also made some um, technical assumption about the ratio for on the jet fuel compared with the other co-product and also the um, energy consumption of this uh, reaction. So you can see, here in the um, case with all optimistic absorption. So we have, uh, we consider that uh, uh, we will have uh, technological optimization in the future. We reach around 2.5 terawatt of electricity needed to produce one terawatt hour of um, jet fuel. Sorry, it's still in French. And in the worst, case, if we can say that, or in the conservative uh, assumption, uh, we reach almost 4.5 terawatt hour of electricity that we need uh, to produce one terawatt hour of uh, jet fuel. So this is a figure that we needed to uh, estimate uh, the need of electricity in France for the production of e-fuel by 2050. So we, we, we could do the calculation and you can see on the on the chart, on the graphic, um, the, the total electricity consumption that will be required for the synthesis uh, of e-fuel in 2050 to comply with the um, decarbonization target of the refuel uh, uh, 
um, EU, uh, refuel EU aviation and for the maritime also. Uh, in the scenario with the low demand and with the optimistic um, uh, assumption, we, are, we, we will need 44 terawatt hours of electricity per year. So it's per year. And in the scenario with really high demand and concert, uh, conservative um, assumption, we are, on, we are around 175 terawatt hours per year. Just to give you uh, an example of what it means, this 175 terawatt hours, it's equivalent for France of uh, 13 new uh, generation uh, nuclear. So for what we are calling uh, EPR, so it's quite a lot. We are still uh, building the first one in Flamanville. Um, if we want to compare, so we try to compare this number to, to see if it was, um, um, how do you say that? If the projection was uh, right or not. So we compare with other prospective uh, work ongoing in France. So this morning we had a presentation of um, Christophe on the SFEC, so the French strategy on energy and climate. You see, so it, it was the run uh, one. This morning, he presented the run two, but the estimated needed of electricity for e-fuel, it was around 110 uh, terawatt hour of electricity. So not so, so far from this scenario. And for ADEM, in the prospective work that we have done uh, in transition 2050, uh, it's very, <laughs> we were very uh, lower. It was 18 terawatt hour of electricity because in this scenario, we um, we had a lot of uh, reduce uh, reduced demand for if for SAF and also we use a lot of uh, biofuel and just uh, a last comparison it is we we wanted to compare with uh, total um, electricity production that we will have in france in 2050 so this uh, i don't have time to to detail this but it is um prospective work that we have done in France. This too is within ADEM. This too, it's outside uh, ADEM. It's not our work, but it's um, um, RTE, so the electric, uh, electricity uh, network, French electricity network uh, uh, actor. And you can see, uh, for example, what we estimate uh, as total electricity production in France by 2050, it's around, for this scenario, 660 terawatt hour. So if we look at this one, it's one third production of the total uh, electricity production that we need to implement if we want to, to comply with this decarbonization target. So this part is for the electricity. The next calculation was about the biogenic CO2. We are today... <gasps> Okay. Uh, no, 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 it's, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, I will go fast. Uh, how I can go fast? The, so the discussion that we have on the CO2, it's which kind of CO2 to use, because we have different kind of origin of CO2. You can use CO2 from um, industries using fossil, so it's what I'm calling fossil CO2. We decided to discard it, these uh, sources because uh, by um, 2041, it will be forbidden by uh, Renewable Energy Directive. Uh, for the CO2 coming from here, so the direct air capture, it was also discarded because it's too energy intensive. And I told you to uh, produce uh, if electrofuel, it's also energy intensive, so it's not possible to combine two energy intensive. So at the end, we had on only biogenic CO2 as interesting sources for electrofuel. And you can see here the result of the amount. So we are around 6 million tons of CO2 to uh, 19 million tons of CO2. It depends on the scenario and the assumption. Are we, I will go fast, sorry. And so maybe just to talk about this number, um, you can see here, we, we try to see what it means available sources of biogenic CO2, because when we are seeing 6 million tons of CO2 is a um, low demand scenario, what do we have in France now today? It's, um, in, we have 70 units in France that could um, uh, provide this amount of um, CO2 biogenic, but uh, we have a question about the um, location. So we didn't look if the location of this uh, future e-fuel production unit will be near of the unit 
producing CO2, biogenic CO2. So there is a question about that. And the other question is the um, conflict with BEX. So we heard um, in, the, in this panel, in this session, that we need CO2, bio, uh, biogenic CO2 for negative emission. And so there is a question about, do we have uh, enough biogenic CO2 for e-fuel and for BEX? And so just the conclusion, no, just this one, I think the main conclusion is to say, uh, if we want to, um, to comply with the European decarbonization target, the main lever is the sobri uh, sobriety. We need to reduce uh, the demand because when we are reducing the demand, we have, uh, we can mobilize reasonable electricity resources and biogenic CO2. If we don't have this reduction of demand, it will be very difficult to reach this uh, target. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Aisha. Uh, do we have any quick questions? We maybe got time for one. Yes. Yeah, beyond Frege, maybe one quick question. Did you also investigate the costs of these e-fuels and how do they compare to alternatives? <laughs> it was the next step. We have to do the technical economic assessment and also the environmental assessment. It will be the next step. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you very much, Aisha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I'll just leave Daniela to round up. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to thank all speakers for the very interesting content. And I think we have learned two things. One is about the very different pictures and scenario in 2050. But also, and this I really liked very much, interesting source how to come there. Yeah, What are the next steps with regard to flexibility, with regard to BEX? And with this, I think we are back in 2023, uh, uh, exactly at the coffee break. Thank you also to the audience. Yeah. <laughs>